Thank you, Diane, for reading for us from this psalm. Thank you, worship team, for leading us in worship of this great Lord that, whose name is Majestic. Thank you, Brandon, for guiding us. Uh, my name is Glenn. I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, I get to share with you from God's word today. Last week, we started a uh, sermon series. We're pivoting away from uh, the book of Genesis for a little bit while Pastor Carl's on sabbatical. And so we thought it'd be a great time for us to kind of spend a, a moment of rest in the book of Psalms uh, during this season where we get to not just find ourselves there, but we get to find Jesus there in the Psalms. And so we're looking at how Jesus pokes in to these great uh, scriptures and how he is there with us uh, in those moments. Uh, and today, as you just heard, we're going to be looking at Psalm chapter 8. Well, for many of the years that I've, when I was serving as youth pastor in different churches, um, one of the things that people would frequently come to me for was for help with moving. And I think it was partly because I had a pickup truck, which, by the way, if you have a pickup truck, that's the Lord's way of saying you need to help people move. Um, and so people would come to me because I had a pickup truck and I was the youth pastor. And so I had access to helping uh, get some strong, able-bodied movers. And my strategy so that I could do the least amount of heavy lifting myself was to recruit a bunch of high school guys. But there's one crucial element that was needed to actually get those high school guys to really contribute and work hard. Some of those girls that we bring in. Because there's something about high school guys being around who they find to be the cute, attractive girls in youth group to all of a sudden they need to show off and they need to show just how strong they are. So we'd come up to a piano or a dresser or a bed or something like this. And I'd be like, hey, why don't you guys uh, pick this up? They'd be like, I don't know. I'd be like, oh, so-and-so is watching. Well, let me get that for you. You know, and they start carrying that on down. So there's something they just they instinctively they want to. They wanted to flex, right? They wanted to demonstrate. They wanted to show their strength. Our psalm this morning examines a way in which God flexes. And it's not a flex like the high school boys were. It's kind of more selfishly motivated. But when God flexes to demonstrate his strength, guess who benefits? We do. And so this is what this psalm is about. And so we're going to pick up here, starting in verse one that you just heard read, and th- which is, and this is what it says. Our Lord, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. So David opens up with a statement of praise. God, Yahweh, our Lord, our King, our master, your name is majestic over everything on the planet. And you probably noticed as we read, as you heard Diane reading through the verses, the very last verse, you can go ahead and cheat and look to verse nine, says the same exact thing. You guys see that? So when biblical authors do this, the, when they have these kind of parallel phrases that show up in the scriptures, they kind of act as almost a container that's holding on. And everything that's in the middle in this container is a way of shoring up and boosting the claim that is made at the start and at the end, right? So as David, who's the author of the psalm, as he writes, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Everything else in between those statements is going to be to show how God, who is Lord, has a majestic name. Well, what is it that David is doing that inspires him to write this song in the first place? What is it that moves him to praise? It's there in verse one. It's that second part. You, speaking to God, have set your glory above the heavens. So as David is beholding the sky, he's inspired to worship. And we'll see in a moment, it's actually the night sky that he's looking at uh, as he's looking out to to see this. And it causes him to to, something to happen inside of his heart, to to yearn for praise. There's a, a greatness that's there as he's looking at the starry night sky. And and I think we can kind of relate to this. So where I live here in Northwest Reno, uh, I have an HOA for our neighborhood. Do you guys have that? Super obnoxious. I, would, I hope none of you are managing those because we'll probably get in a fight afterwards. Uh, but they just like, basically, they like to give me rules of why I can't do things, right? That's basically, at the end of the day, what, what they like to do. And so uh, in our neighborhood, they, they have some policies in our HOA that says we can't have light pollution. Any of you guys ever experienced that? So basically, it's 
we want to be able to look at the night sky. And so you can't have certain lights at your house and different, like there's no street lamps and things like this so that the, the area can remain dark. Well, why is that? Why would they have light pollution rules in a neighborhood? So that the residents could look at what? The stars, the night sky. There is something about looking up at stars and the moon and galaxies and everything else. There's something that happens in your heart. Have you ever been out like in the desert, middle of the night, maybe you've been driving or camping and you look out and it's just this canvas of lights sparkling in the sky and you just look up at that and it's like, what, is that? what, what does your heart do? There's this kind of wow factor, right? That's what David's experienced. David is looking out at the night sky and there's this wow factor that's happening in his heart that's leading him to write this song. Well, what is it that God is saying through this scene? We heard a little bit about this from Pastor Cassie last week, right? Where he talks about how God is speaking, he speaks in his word and he speaks through his creation. What is it that God is saying that David is hearing in this song? Well, he's going to tell us. And it doesn't seem like it relates at first. So look at, look at verse two. Out of the mouths of babies and infants, you've established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. At first you're like, what does that have to do with the sky? We'll, we'll get there. We will get there. But what David's first doing is demonstrating a pattern that he sees at work in God that is worthy of praise as he's beholding this before God. And, and here's the pattern that God sets, that, that God displays. He establishes strength. He flexes through who? Through what kind of people? Babies and infants. Now, I've been in charge of kids' ministry in the past, different events, been in charge of nursery work. You know how often people would come to me and say, hey, do you have any babies that can help us move? You know, not even once, not even once did anybody come and say, hey, hey, do you have some babies that can help us lift something heavy, right? If you need a demonstration of strength and of wisdom, do you walk over to the nursery and say, hey, I have this philosoph philosophical question I need to answer. Can I talk to one of the babies? We don't do that. Why? They are not symbols of strength and wisdom and power. They are helpless. They are weak. And as far as what they're contributing, they're insignificant. They're not adding anything to the conversation. What they're adding is cuteness, of course. But it's not their strength. It's not their wisdom. It's not their know-how that they're bringing to the table. And what's interesting is God is saying the way in which he flexes is by using what kind of person? A weak, insignificant, unimportant, non-contributing person. That's who these babies and infants represent. The way in which God silences his enemies, his critics, is by doing incredible things through those who can't do anything for themselves. We see something kind of similar as far as a reputation for people who can do this in the sports arena. Some teams are built with a kind of balance and you have a lot of star players or a lot of contributors and there's a lot of really good teamwork that's happening and they have success because they have a great team that's been put together. And then some sports, with some teams, it's really more about a single player who's in this all-star figure. Everybody else is no good. But when they win, who gets all the credit? The all-star. Right? The one who's carrying the rest of their team on their back. Now, when we think, look at a well-balanced team, everybody's getting praise and accolades and everything else. But when you go to, the, to a team where it's just one really good guy who's doing all the work, who gets the credit? That one guy does. That's how God operates. God's doing the same thing. When God goes to, to pick his baseball team, soccer team, football team, he makes sure to pick people who can't run, kick, throw, or have any kind of hand-eye coordination. That's how God operates. God does things with people who the only explanation can be that he's the one doing it. Does that make sense? And so this is the pattern, this kind of elevation of the lowly, the, the exaltation of those who are small, the making significant of those who are insignificant. This is the pattern that David's thinking of as, as he's writing this psalm. That, looking at the night sky, is what caused him to have this thought in the first place. Well, how did that even happen? Look what he says in verses 3 4, and we'll, we'll start to make the connections. 
verse three and four. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars, which you've set in place, what is man that you're mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? See, I told you we'd get to the night sky. You see the night sky in here? What's he talking about? Moon and stars, right? So it's David's looking at the night sky. And as he looks into the night sky, he begins to think of humanity. See, in comparison to the greatness of the cosmos, of the skies, of the, the lights in the heavens and the, the galaxies that are at present and the stars that represent solar systems, many of which are bigger than ours, you begin to have a greater awareness of just how small you are, right? That's one of the experiences. I've been out in the desert, night sky, looking at it, and just you feel there's wonder, but there's also a smallness you feel about yourself. And so in comparison to all the things that God has made, which are simply, he says, the work of his fingers, right? The entire galaxy is made with God's fingertips. He didn't, he didn't break in, into a sweat at all to make what he made. And David marvels, thinking, how small are we? What is God? What are we, who are we that God would even remember us? We are so small. We are so insignificant. Surely God's got bigger fish to fry. Humanity is so insignificant. How could God even be aware of us? Why would he be mindful? Why would he even care who we are, what we're doing. We're sitting here in Reno. That isn't necessarily the, the, the pinnacle of human civilization. Why would God have any remote interest about anything happening in this room? And yet he does. Look what David says next. Verse five through eight. He says, yet. Yet, yeah, in spite of how small we are, in spite of how insignificant we are in light of the entire scope of the universe, yet you've made him, meaning mankind, humanity, a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You've given him dominion over the work of your hands. You've put all things under his feet, all sheep, all oxen, beasts of the field, birds of the heavens, fish of the sea, and whatever passes along the paths of the seas. What has God done that David is marveling at as he looks at the night sky? He feels the weight of insignificance and he marvels. But we are not insignificant. We have been made significant. And that's the marvel. That's what's causing David to erupt in praise. He says, you've made humanity a little lower than the heavenly beings, which is interesting. That's probably what most of our translations say. But the word that's being used for heavenly beings is, is the word Elohim, which is uh, a Hebrew word that, that means you could you translate it as, as God, as God's plural. Um, sometimes it does get used to talk about heavenly beings. But basically what David is saying is as far as the pecking order in, in the existence of all things, humanity sits just below divinity. There's an elevation of humanity, an importance that has been placed upon humanity as we sit here in our existence. They're in the tier right below. And so David marvels that God has crowned the human race in such a way with glory and honor. What's interesting is, and we've talked about this in Genesis in the series that we've been looking at uh, over the last couple of months, God created humanity in his own image. There is nothing else in the existence of all creation that is made in God's image. Only we are. Not angels, not animals, not planets, not solar systems, not galaxies. Only us. We are created in the image of God. We are crowned in glory and honor. And as part of that crowning, David says in these verses, that humanity has been given dominion over the rest of creation. And he references specifically the animal kingdom. And it's looking back to the creation account in Genesis where God has put everything into the stewardship of Adam and Eve, the first, our first parents. And, and that exists today. Humanity is meant 
to have dominion, to steward everything in the universe. What's interesting too, the very last thing that he talks about, so he talks about the animals on the earth, right? Sheep and oxen, beasts of the field. He talks about the birds of the heavens, the skies up above, and he talks about the fish of the sea. And then he says this weird little phrase, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. And some of the commentaries that I was reading feel like this is a veiled reference to a spiritual reality known as Leviathan. Have you ever heard the phrase Leviathan? It's a biblical concept. It's, a, it's basically a big sea dragon, and the Bible talks about this. It's, it's this, this sea, this symbolic sea creature that is a representation of the forces of evil, specifically the devil, right? Because what does the devil appear to Adam and Eve in the garden? A serpent, right? Egypt, anytime these kind of spiritual realities are taking over a, a, a country and, and persecuting God's people, they'll be referred to as Leviathan or this dragon or this creature or this beast. That's why you see these kind of images in Revelation as well. And so what's interesting when he says, whatever passes along the paths of the sea seems to be a reference to Leviathan. In other words, even these great spiritual realities that God has created are placed underneath who? Humanity. And it's not because we're brighter or more powerful or stronger. God has elevated humanity in such a way that he's placing all things under our feet. And it is reflecting on this reality that leads David to utter praise. O oh Lord, how, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. That's why he closes verse nine this way. God is taking what appears insignificant and unimportant and he's exalting it. He is crowning the insignificant. And this is God's flex because at no point can humanity say we have arrived here on our own merit. No, we've had somebody who's picked us up and set us and has displayed us for the sake of his glory for the sake of his strength and majesty. And so it's a wonder. You probably haven't reflected on the stars at night in such a way that leads you to think about how God elevates people like us, but that's what David sings of. But what's interesting is that the biblical authors, specifically in the New Testament, see that God did not stop that elevation back at David's time. In other words, God was not done elevating humanity just when he created us. But there was going to be a way in which God would take humanity and make us even more significant than we already were. And the author of Hebrews picks up on this in Hebrews chapter 2, where he actually quotes from this very psalm. So go, if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to Hebrews chapter 2. Just to take a look at verses 5 through 9 where you're going to see the author of Hebrews talk about this reality of God's elevation of humanity. And so this is what he says. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we're speaking. It's been testified somewhere, which I love. You guys don't have to memorize verse references. That's The author of Hebrews didn't know where it was found. He just said it's found somewhere. What is man that you're mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. You made him a little while lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor, Because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. So basically, the author surveys the world, the author of Hebrews, and says, presently, it doesn't look like everything in existence is underneath humanity, is underneath mankind. He believes that it's going to happen. He believes that everything in all of creation, every reality, every concept, every dream Every idea belongs in subjection underneath the human race. He says even death itself is to be placed beneath a human being's feet. 
And here's where we begin to really marvel at just how much God has elevated the significance of the human race. Because the author of Hebrews is not talking about all human beings in general. He's talking about one specific human being through which everything's being placed under his feet. And who is he? Jesus Christ. All of reality belongs under the feet of Jesus. Everything. He is over everything. Why? Because Jesus Christ is the creator of everything. And so he reigns over everything. And this is where we see the true exaltation of humanity. God became what? What did God become? A human being. God, the creator of the universe, became one of us. Those same fingers that traced out the stars and formed the moon would one day be holding on to the fingers of his mother. He became one of us. And Jesus did not simply become one who looked like a human being. Jesus became fully, truly human in all senses of the term. Jesus fully became a man. What does that mean? It means that the creator of the cosmos would now get hungry and need a snack. It means that this creator, when growing up, would need diaper changes. means he would grow up playing with action figures. He would one day have to do his taxes. He would end up burying his father. He would have conflict with his friends. People would oppose him and hate him. He'd be misunderstood. He'd be rejected. He would need a nap. Jesus Christ became fully human for us. How did God crown humanity ultimately with glory and honor? He took humanity into his own glory and honor and added it to himself. And this is just something that absolutely blows my mind. And I want this truth to just land heavy on us this morning. The most powerful being in all of existence is human. He's one of us. He's one of ours. The most powerful being in existence is human. Sometimes we think about Jesus as he uh, becomes one of us, that this is a a temporary stint, right? That he's just doing this for a period of time, and then he's going to go back to just God stuff and kind of lay aside the human stuff. That's not the case. Jesus, right now, in this moment, sits on a throne in heaven as a man. When we stand before God one day, guess whose face we will see? A human being's. We will see the face of Jesus, the man. God in the flesh. Jesus is a human permanently and will never stop. He added humanity to his divinity. Becoming like you and becoming like me, Jesus was able to satisfy all of the requirements necessary for you and for me to spend eternity with God. That's why he did it. He thought you and I were worthwhile to sacrifice everything, to humble himself permanently, to take on our finite bodies. He believed you were worthwhile to do that. He has crowned you, Anna, 
with glory and honor. Jesus lived for you. Jesus died for you. Jesus rose for you. And that's how you are now significant. It's because of what he has done. So this reality that God has crowned the insignificant attacks kind of two opposite but related attitudes that we struggle with. And I think we each probably fall into one of these attitudes more than the other. We, uh, and we probably wrestle with both of them, but I think most of us will identify with one of these two attitudes. So let me talk about them as kind of people, okay? That, that, that this reality that God crowns the insignificant addresses. First, this reality addresses all of those who are pit dwellers. What do I mean by a pit dweller? Somebody whose life's always in the pits. Nothing is good about them or their circumstances, right? They're just, everything is bad. I'm not important. I don't matter. I'm insignificant. I'm the worst. A pit dweller believes that they're only ever insignificant. They believe that they do not matter. They believe that they are a burden to everyone and everything. They believe they are an inconvenience, that they're not worth the time for anybody to intervene. A pit dweller believes that they are unloved and unlovable. And rather than seeing their own worth, they feel worthless. Now, while somebody who has this attitude might appear to be humble in the sense that they're not exalting themselves, it is actually from a position of arrogance that we, we believe this about ourselves, that we believe we are that insignificant. A pit dweller is basically saying to the face of God, nice try, God, but I'm too far gone. God, I know you're powerful, but you're not powerful enough to make me matter. God, I know you're all loving, but your, your love can't overcome my problems. It's basically to constantly say to God, nice try, but you just don't know. You're not an expert at judging my worth and my value. Does that sound like humility or arrogance to speak that to God? Yeah. Are you a pit dweller? Here's what God says to you through the message of Psalm 8. If if you feel like your life's in the pits, you matter. You are significant. You are important. You are deeply loved. You are worthwhile. Believe that because that is what God says about you. It's what God says about me. So there's no place for moping around and wallowing in self-pity. The God of the universe has become just like you to ensure you can be with him forever. Like specifically you, not people in general, but when Jesus went to the cross, he had you specifically in mind and wanted you in his family forever. You matter. So that's one attitude Psalm 8 address, the pit dweller. The other attitude Psalm 8 addresses, the ladder climber. A ladder climber is a person who has a sense and awareness that they were made for more, that they are significant, and so lives in such a way to try to secure that significance for themselves. A ladder climber has an attitude that they will miss the boat if they don't work hard enough to carve out a place of significance for themselves. And so they climb up the ladder of life, often at the expense of their fellow human beings, to try to become important, to try to matter, to try to be significant. And the ultimate fear, I think, that the ladder climber has is the fear of being forgotten, the fear of not counting. The pit dweller accepts, I'm forgotten, I don't matter. The ladder climber is terrified that that's what will happen, and they do whatever they can to try to keep that from happening. So while it is right for somebody with this attitude to believe that they were made for something more, it is wrong to believe that your significance depends on your efforts to achieve that significance. 
Again, it's rooted in arrogance. How arrogant must I be if I believe that I, on my own, am able to have some kind of eternal lasting significance in this world? I can't on my own. Are you a ladder climber? Here's what God says to you through the message of Psalm 8. You are not significant because of what you've done. You are significant because of what God has done. You matter to him because of who he is, not because of anything you've done for yourself. We need to believe that. And when we don't believe that, man, it's so crushing, isn't it? Because what inevitably happens for the person climbing the ladder is they don't achieve enough. They're not significant enough. They aren't able to get whatever there is they're after. They can't carve out that space for them to matter. And it's crushing. Because left to ourselves, we can't be as significant as we know we're made to be. It is God who makes us significant. Friend, you might be a follower of Jesus here, or might not yet be a follower of Jesus here this morning. And we're super glad that you've decided to join us and be a part of what we're doing this morning. And I'm guessing that you resonate with at least one of the two of those attitudes, the pit dweller or the ladder climber. Maybe you struggle with both in different seasons. What you need more than anything else is to be in a relationship with the God who hung the stars and the moon. With the God who believed we were worthwhile, so much so that he would send his one and only son to live the life that we should have lived and then die the death we deserve to die. We want you to experience lasting significance. I know you know you're made for more. There's got to be more than, than simply going to work and dealing with the things you're dealing with. You know you're made for more. And what I'm telling you this morning is you were made for this creator God, Jesus Christ. And he wants to know you. He wants to bring meaning and purpose and significance into your life. And only he can do it. You cannot do it yourself. You might be saying, I did, you Glenn, you don't know what I have done. I've done some pretty horrible things in my time. Yeah, I have too. I don't deserve to be up here. I don't deserve, deserve to be down there. I don't deserve to be alive. And yet God has shown me mercy and love. And he wants to do the same for you. If that's you today. At the close of the service, we're going to have a couple of our elders will be available up here to pray. Uh, Brandon mentioned he'll be down here. Um, maybe you came with somebody who's a follower of Jesus. Have a conversation about how you can begin a relationship with the God who makes all things significant in his purposes and his good pleasure. So if that's you, talk to one of us this morning. Let's pray together. Father, what a marvel it is to us that you would crown the human race with glory and honor. Father, this room is filled with royalty. And none of us are self-made men or women. God, we are who we are because of what you have said and because of what you have done. And so, Father, some of us today, we came into this room and man, we're in the pits. We're just in the pits. We don't feel good about ourselves. We don't feel good about what's going on in our lives. We feel like failures. We feel like we don't matter. But, Father, help us believe the truth of Psalm 8, of Hebrews 2, that says we do matter. We are significant. Father, help us rest in that truth. Father, some of us has come in today desperate to matter, desperate to be significant, desperate to make a mark. And as we see, God, we can't do that on our own. 
you alone are the one who determines who and what is significant. So Father, I pray that in your kindness, you would help us to identify our right place in this universe, submitting to you in all things and finding all of our meaning and purpose in your world. So God, we thank you. We love you. We trust you. It's in Jesus' name we pray all of these things. Amen. Let's stand and respond by singing, Even So Come.